So I've, I've asked that the images behind you just do their thing. And if you need to know about the images, come talk to me later. I don't have time to play grandpa with the slides, so we're just going to work this the way we have to work it. So the first question anybody asks you in the South is, who you kin to? And my people have been in North Carolina since 1674. My um, fourth great-grandmother was born in Northampton County. My third great-grandfather, her son, was born there. My third great-grandfather was from Warren County. And my fifth great-grandfather and his family, going back to the 1670s, were from Bertie, Halifax, Nash, and Edgecombe counties. So we have been in North Carolina for a long time. We've also been in South Carolina for a long time, from Charleston to Edgefield County to Lancaster, Kershaw, and Chesterfield counties. So you have to present who your people are first, because you where your credentials come from. <laughs> I know how this works. So, who am I? I was born beneath the Mason-Dixon line. I'm the 14th generation of my family to be born in America. I'm the child of migrants who were the children of migrants who were the children of migrants, who were the children of forced migrants. My base is DC, and sometimes you can call me a Washingtonian. I'm a living history interpreter. I cook food, I garden, I forage. I teach about food, spirituality, history, meaning, and matter. I believe that writing is fighting and cooking is revolution. So my piece on Paula Dean, you know, she bless her heart, she danced with the stars. <laughs> you gotta give it up to pa Paula and articles on Ferguson communicate how I feel food can not only be transformative, but essential to knowledge. In denying and destroying the artificial boundaries that separate us and redefine those boundaries that just are and must be. Before I continue, I, I wanna thank uh, some people who are here. Ira Wallace from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Um, <laughs> when, when no one knew who I was, and they had the first Heritage Harvest Festival at Monticello, I called her up and said, please let me do this. Please let me be involved in this. And she said, I don't know who you are, but sure, whatever you want to do. And I, I, said, I gave, this, gave her this compliment at Old Salem uh, about a month ago, but I give her to it again. It's that act of letting the youth have a chance that moves things forward. So I bless her for that. And Debbie Moose, I'm winking at you. Um, Debbie Moose was part of the pie brigade that we had at Stagville Plantation, not far from here, where we did a dinner um, for 150 people in 2013 to honor the enslaved ancestors who were at Stagville Plantation. If you don't know about Stagville, there were over 900 enslaved people. There was a 10,000 acre plantation, the largest in North Carolina. And we prepared an entire meal, with the exception of the pies, which Debbie and Nancy McDermott and other North Carolina cookbook authors and historians prepared, um, all on the open hearth, using food from first-hand foods. First-hand foods, we love you. Thank you very much. Um, and other North Carolina growers and providers, that was the majority of the food that we had. So I want to thank um, everybody who made that dinner possible to honor those ancestors and to bring a reality, a dream um, to pass, that they were not forgotten, their cuisine, their traditions were not forgotten, and furthermore, young people got to see the entire community come together, every background, to honor not only their memory, but their legacy and their important American, Southern and North Carolina life. Okay, so. <laughs> this is where it gets interesting. I wrote an article about barbecue in The Guardian. I know y'all know about barbecue down here. It was published on July 4th, of course. My premise is that barbecue is true freedom food. It was conceived in the collision of native and African culinary genius in the Caribbean and the American Southeast. Barbecue was the food of pre-industrial people of color, seeking refuge as maroons in the spirit of resistance against slavery and colonization. When you are a person of color, how you survive your oppression is your greatest source of cultural capital. It trickled down to those societies to become a hallmark of a uniquely polyglot and American approach to food. 
It brings us together because it's communal, multicultural, made and eaten in the celebration of human liberty and freedom, and bounds us and our ancestors together. But that's not what people reading The Guardian got out of it. I present to you Michael W. Twitty, The Mean Messages. Real people from people, real messages from people who labeled my essay drivel. First one, this, was, this one's exciting. Of the many excellent reasons to ignore the moral claims of identity politics, perhaps the most compelling is that the whole mummery threatens to turn you into a bore. At a barbecue, Mr. Twitty will be less welcome than an evangelical vegan. <laughs> Bless his heart. I look forward to the author's next installment to tell us how Africans and American Indians helped humanity understand the importance of drinking water. I'll give, I'll give Roger Hendricks points for that. I think Mr. Twitty has been watching too many Tarzan movies. Ooh, this is exciting. I have, you know I haven't read these before. I had a friend of mine pluck these out. I've been too, I can't, I can't read my comments ever. That's a good, that's good advice. So this is the first time I'm reading these two. Truly beyond asinine, this article is a disgrace and demonstrates a new depth of utter stupidity. Next we'll be told barbecue is racist if its instructions are not printed in any language other than Ebonics. Ooh. You gotta love your haters, babies. Are you kidding me? Someone let this ignorant Column, get inches in the Guardian. Barbecue is simply roasting meat over coals. Written by a true idiot, because you know better than that. <laughs> it's been done since caveman days. Unless the first caveman was a North Carolinian, that's a complete lie. <laughs> to act as if it's some sort of cultural appropriation is beyond stupid. Um, the most absurd article I've ever read in the Guardian. This author has a very mental illness. Um, no amount of barbecue sauce will mask the taste of white guilt. Oh, oh, this one's good. Twitty claims to be Irish, which I am part Irish, you know, as most black people in this room are. I mean, let's be real as well as black, Jewish, and gay, which I am. I hit the, I hit the you know, I hit the jackpot, thank you, God. <laughs> and then they say, it's identity, polix, it's identity pol politics bingo. Oh, this is good. Twitty's next piece is called, Enjoy That Banana Sunday, Evil Whitey People. <laughs> Woo, so, wow. Obviously, <laughs> eaters are, you know, politicians of the mouth. Ooh, that, that, was, that, was, that was fun, almost. The, the group, it's better. It's always better with the group. Whew. All right, fan myself. All right. We are held captive by our angst over the reality of food and the illusion of race. We have made the illusion of race more powerful than the truth of ethnicity, of culture, and the import of history. We have destroyed the conversation by searching for sound bites in 140 characters to make answers to centuries old arguments. I believe that a problem can be stated in terms of race, class, history, gender, and identity, and solved in terms of food, cooking, the meeting ground, the table, and the rituals of a properly enjoyed meal. What I want us to do is not have a cliche moment of togetherness, Kumbaya is not the goal. The goal is to revel, to revel in our disagreements, to have discussion, argument, to listen, to have conversation, understanding, resolution, reconciliation, and healing, acknowledging the power of humanity and coming to the terms with the reality that if so many of us were not denied our humanity for so long, we wouldn't be arguing in 2015 over what descriptor precedes the phrase lives matter. I conceived the cooking gene several years ago because I wanted to locate my culinary homeland and understand it. I want to, to stop forgetting people and places and names 
and really be able to address my food the way people on TV did when they wax poetic about their food from a foreign land. Whereas, where, as the descendant of so many purposely anonymous enslaved people and not so anonymous enslavers, was I to find my cultural identity? How could I claim the mantle of an African-American culinary expert when I didn't feel com competent within my soul to define those terms on my own ground? I began my life hating soul food with its bones in the pot, funk and earthiness. The supposition that I being born black was supposed to like this stuff or therefore forfeit my blackness. I didn't want that to be honest. So my grandmother and my parents sat around to change that. And so I began to love my food and love my blackness and love my history. And I found my humanity, but there were pieces missing in the mosaic. So I got on the road and we traveled the entire South, Maryland to Texas, Missouri to Florida, looking for my story, our story, Africa to America, slavery to freedom, to uncover what the American table and I shared in our genealogy. When we were in Natchez, Mississippi, we were at a gathering at Melrose Estate. We can't call it a plantation because the actual plantation was across the river in Louisiana. And I was told after meeting um, a hero of the civil rights movement, um, Mr. James Meredith was there. I was told this was the largest interracial gathering that Natchez had seen in years of whites and blacks coming together to hear my presentation about gardening and see me cook the historic way, as I often do. And people had conversations about, oh, that's your last name, that's my last name too. Well, <laughs> oh, you go to that church? That's not far down the road from. And so they started talking for the first time. And it was really exciting to see, you know, these hands together at the table, sorting field peas and cutting peaches and having a conversation that they had not had since perhaps before the Civil War. We went to Atlanta and we saw African-American communities taking organic farming, community farming into their own hands. And it was the first time I ever saw a dollar stay in my community, all through food. We went to Birmingham, we went, we went to the Baptist church that was bombed during the Civil Rights Movement. We went to do a presentation on kosher soul food, which I hope you'll join me for tomorrow, at a temple in Birmingham that was also threatened with bombing. And I met people there who really shook up my whole sense of why I was doing this. I met, I met two ladies, and these two ladies were from Germany, they were both survivors. And um, they were survivors in the sense of they were actually in the Shoah and they were the only two people in their family to survive the Shoah, the Holocaust. They had um, numbers on their arms. They were twin sisters. And they said to me, I prefaced my talk by saying, this is the first time I've ever been to my grandmother's hometown of Birmingham, Alabama. My grandmother left Birmingham under duress during the Great Migration. She vowed never to come back. And I said, this is my first time here. And these two ladies who had a lifetime of incredible memories and experiences and triumphs and tragedies looked me dead in the face and said, I was just telling my sister, I'm glad that when we came to America, we came to Birmingham because we saw how awful things were, and we had to change it. We had to take people to work. We had to help people get registered to vote. And we're glad we did all that so that you could come home to Alabama. Now you think about that. They were kicked out of their home, Jewish like me, persecuted. But to them, one of their greatest triumphs was not walking out of the Shoah alive. It was making sure that I could come home to Alabama the heart of Dixie. On the eastern shore of Maryland, we walked the grounds where Frederick Douglass was enslaved. In southern Maryland, we saw the last remaining slave cabin at Sodley Plantation, a 300-year-old spot, and talked to Mr. Briscoe, who still had seeds passed down from his grandfather's grandfather, who was enslaved at Sodley. 
we went to Florida to Kingsley Plantation where Zephaniah Kingsley introduced African and West Indian crops because he was a slave trader and also because his three wives, who he had at the same time, were all African born. You can look that up later. I'm sure you'll be interested to know about that. <laughs> In New Orleans, we met Jenga Window, who is a vegan and a raw eater. So she's raising her daughter raw and vegan in New Orleans. That's a miracle. <laughs> wow. But more importantly was the fact that she came back from New York after Katrina to help rebuild the Lower Ninth Ward and to increase food justice in New Orleans. We went to Donaldsonville, Louisiana, the River Road Museum. And there we read about, saw a document by an organization of black farmers um, in Donaldsonville in 1912, who said, we will not allow our men and our women to suffer debt, to eat on these sugarcane plantations. We will make a farm where any, anybody who is hungry can come get food, and they can take with dignity so they don't go into further debt. The first thing I thought was, you mean in 1912 we figured this out without the internet? We can't figure this mess out now. And I, and I should honor my grandfather, um, Gons Lee Twitty, um, who was one of the founders of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Um, my grandfather's 97. He's not exactly driving anymore. But um, I'm sure if my grandfather was here, he would be more than proud to know that the work has continued to the next generation and generation after that. When we went to Kentucky, we saw barns full of bar burly tobacco. South Carolina and Charleston, I have walked the grounds where our ancestors were buried from 300 years ago to the present. And I had the opportunity to sit at the same table as the representative who was murdered in Charleston. We met that night at the Nat Fuller dinner, honoring Nat Fuller, an African-American chef during uh, Reconstruction who had the first reconciliation dinner. How ironic that that event um, was such an opportunity, and yet several weeks later, that tragedy happened. In Richmond, I stood on the banks of the James River where my fifth great-grandfather was brought from Africa, and I stood at the spot of Lumpkin's Jail where my third great-grandfather was sold away from his family, and my great-great-great-grandmother was sold with her children to Alabama. We went to Arkansas and we saw green rice fields in East Texas where we had Texas barbecue, and I won't even go there tonight. <laughs> so don't ask me. But we also made meals on the same spot as our forefathers and foremothers, barbecuing over an open pit, a hole in the ground, teaching people about the origins and history of East Texas barbecue. And here in North Carolina, I was privileged to have cooking space with my friend, Chef Mike Moore, Blind Pig in Asheville, where we did a dinner honoring all of our ancestors and talking about the roots of Southern food. I've been across the South many, many, many times, and I'm fortunate to have seen it. It's an, it in an entire breath. And um, I can only say that this is truly my home and my heritage and my culinary homeland. I made a number of discoveries on this cooking gene tour the multiple trips over the past few years. One of my big discoveries was that the Southern white man is not my combatant, but my cousin. He is not to be blamed for his ancestry, but how he chooses to imagine the future. Where we most both come to terms with the past in order to move forward. I discovered other Southerners, Native American, Latino, Asian, Middle Eastern, and those from the Indian subcontinent are not to be ignored. And they are building a new understanding of what it means to be Southern, eat Southern, and identify with our historical legacy. I discovered other black people in their journeys on the continent of Africa and the African diaspora that are indeed my blood and genetic cousins, my family, my kith and kin. While some were distant kin lost in time in Africa, Others were hints that one sibling was put on the slave ship bound to Haiti and the other one to South Carolina. 
from the port of Wida and Benin and we're never to see each other again. I tell you something, it's, it's something to actually look at your genetic profile and see cousins born in other countries and know that part of you is in Barbados, in Brazil, in Cuba, in Jamaica, all these places, in Haiti, and know that one of you got on the boat and went here. One of you got on the boat and went there. And nobody ever imagined that you'd find out. That sense of family, of being belonging to people, was the greatest thing I discovered. That family is the most important thing. Family is not just blood. Family is not just genes. Family is what you talked about earlier. It's connection in truth. It's a kinship and a twinning that goes beyond any boundary that we've artificially and arbitrarily placed upon ourselves. So I decided to enhance and empower this journey with genetic data so I could claim this legacy. I wanted people to know and understand this is my bone, this is my blood. The colors bloomed on the maps and more relatives came and more tests were taken and more circles began to increase until there was African, European, Native American, Southeast Asian, Central Asian, Middle Eastern, East Asian, Polynesian, and Spanish, and Portuguese blood in my DNA. My DNA was not black. It was the rainbow at the crossroads of humanity. Yes, I am Irish, black, gay, and Jewish. Thank you, Lord. But I'm also Viking and British and French and Asian and Native American and everything else in between. But mostly I'm proud to say that I'm human and Southern by the grace of God. I could finally see myself in the caves of Western Europe the rise of the Neolithic agriculture in Northeast Africa and the Middle East, and the first apples raised in the Asian steppe, the three sisters from Mesoamerica to the American Southeast, the jungles of Southeast Asia's archipelago, where the edible catalyst for slavery, sugarcane, was born, and where my Indonesian ancestors set sail from Madagascar, bringing plantains, bananas, and taro. I have the blood of, Madaga have the blood of Africa's earliest hunter-gatherers, and humanity's first fire makers in my genes. The Mende and Timne of Sierra Leone who brought rice agriculture to the low country and a love of leafy, leafy greens. The Akan of Ghana who, brought, who taught the English how to make corn and sweet potatoes sing on Virginia plantations. The Fulani who reinforced the South's love of buttermilk. The Wolof who made red rice and jambalaya and hop and john realities. The Igbo of Nigeria and the Mbundu of Congo and Angola who brought forth okra soup Black, pea, black eyed pea cakes, gumbo, and the Hossa who brought you barbecue, and their language, babaki. I also want to tell about those victories, and I want to talk about the work to be done. Our people, the African American people, our nation, went from 90% agrarian to 90% urban in less than two thirds of a century. It is not just a connection to land through farming, but a sustainable use of nature that requires reconnection. But yet our children say, I ain't no damn slave. And some of our elders say, I don't want to go to no plantation. And some folks say, I don't want to go back. Symbols, vagueness, obfuscation. But I have a mandate, a mandate to return. I have nowhere to go but back to where we started because I want to reclaim the wisdom that will save us in the now. Between the salt retaining survivor genes passed down to us in the transatlantic journey that Texas school books are hell-bent on redefining as just the triangular trade, and the constant stressors of economic instability and systemic racism, cycles of violence built on lack of self-awareness and lack of self-knowledge, and the perpetuation of abuse learned in bondage, and the disaster of food deserts, the long middle passage is still claiming victims. Its horrific legacy is still dragging my people kicking and screaming to the grave. When I put on the clothes that transform me into a representative of my ancestors, when I pick up the cooking pot and change heirlooms and heritage breeds and wild foods into delicacies, I am doing it as an act of war. What, I, what if I told you about a group of people who were passionate composters, masters of horticulture, organic agriculture, of people who wasted nothing, repurposed every human-made thing that was wood or metal or bone. What if I told you 
about their permaculture, how ingenious it was, how adaptive they were, how their cuisine was fusion cuisine, whole animal cooking, full of vegetables, fruits, foraged food, and sustainable fish and game. Well, you know those people already. They're called the enslaved people of African America we hear from 1619 to 1865. But they don't get the credit. And their descendants, the freedmen, who built strong communities, strong churches, who put their faith in God, put their faith in their ancestors, put their faith in the land, do not get the credit either. Their descendants, free landowners and sharecroppers, don't get the credit. And today, our young people who are trying to change things all across the country, but especially in the South and African American communities, do not get the credit either. We have to understand something, culinary justice, is not only about making sure we attribute our recipes and attribute the process by which those recipes and ingredients happen, but is about giving due credit to a long line of people whose knowledge and know-how was brought here by force, who were stolen but determined to earn their respect from the moment they got here until now. And there are more of us for the good than there are for the bad. And this is the ultimate truth. We have to be careful about where the land goes. We, in our discussion this morning, one of my new friends asked me, what should I do with my family's land? The answer is obvious, keep it. The land is our health, and the land is our wealth. My grandfather's legacy was so that black farmers could retain the soil the soil that they did not receive under the promise, the justly held promise of 40 acres and a mule with the land that they bought, that they worked for. And I'm a legacy of that. I'll tell you something, it is something to see your great, great grandfather, his X mark, because he couldn't read or write on a deed saying he's a landowner. He went from being a sharecropper to a landowner in 24 hours after months, years of saving money, not being able to read and write. And by that point, he was in, almost incapacitated and traveled around by a wheelbarrow. But yet, he owned land. He passed that land down to my, my grandfather and his brothers and sisters. And to this day, there will always be a road in South Carolina called the Horn Twitty Road because I will make sure that those who come after me will retain it and preserve it and remember what their great great granddaddy did for them. It is a must, it is a must, it is an important thing for everyone here to understand that what we're talking about are the preservation of spiritual and mystical principles, of truths that our ancestors passed down to us. When you talk to my friend Matthew Rayford, who has Gilliard Farms in Brunswick, Georgia, he talks about this, he talks about when he wants to know about how to garden something, he doesn't open up a gardening book. He talks to his grandmother. That's the way it should be done. He calls his elders up and says, how do we do this? How should this be done? And then he tells the young people come and volunteer, intern and work for him, how things to be done, how are to be done. When you know who you are, you don't, pull it up, you don't put a bullet in your brother's back. That's a fact. When you have your hands in the soil, you don't have time to put your hands on a gun. When you eat good food, you have, your brain has the capacity to learn. So all of our problems, all of our challenges as a people, all go back to changing the composition of our brains by changing the composition of our soil. So I exhort you to preserve the land. Our ancestors are suffering from collective amnesia. Our, their graves are now resorts and hunt clubs, golf courses and gas stations. They have been nearly all annihilated. My ancestors, our ancestors, the mothers and fathers of Southern cuisine who cooked and created this genius pastime of delicacy and make do, all in the crucible of slavery, deserve our eternal respect and eternal memory as much as any statue or any flag. I have been waved away from them a million times, but I won't let them go. 
They have something to teach us, a knowledge system that is in danger of going extinct. What kind of wood do you use to cook? When is the persimmon ripe to pick? Or when is the time to harvest poke? What is the proverbial meaning of okra or sesame? What is the bioenergy of a hot red pepper and the wisdom of sorghum? These are the volumes I read in the Library of Early African American Culinary Knowledge. To quote the beloved playwright August Wilson, author of the piano lesson, I place myself on the self-defining ground of the slave quarter to reclaim the ingredients, the utensils, the methods, and the formulas of this heritage becomes the ground on which I cook and will never die. So farmers, cooks, eaters, growers, producers, with your seeds tell stories. With your meals communicate your message. With your tables tell the truth. But most of all, remember where you came from and who the, who the future holds you responsible to. Thank you. <laughs>